Good day, everyone. On behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia Series and our sponsor, Nanotemper Technologies, I'd like to welcome you to the role of assembly factors in ribosome biogenesis. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'm the host and the moderator for today's event. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter for today. He is Dr. Brett Thurlow, PhD, Application Specialist with Nanotemper Technologies. Welcome, Dr. Thurlow. The presenter ball is yours. Thank you for that introduction, Elizabeth, and good afternoon to everyone. Today I will be discussing the role of assembly factors in ribosome biogenesis. I would like to start by giving a brief background or a brief overview of some of the topics I will be discussing today. I will first provide a brief background on ribosome assembly and some of the key factors involved. Next, I will describe the various approaches our lab used for investigating the assembly process and interactions involved. And lastly, I will wrap up with some concluding remarks. Ribosomes are one of the most complex and abundant macromolecules found in cells with a size of about 2.5 megadaltons. The ribosome functions as the protein manufacturing machine of the tr by translating genetic information into functional proteins and is therefore central to all life. Shown here is a cryo-electron microscopy density map of the prokaryotic ribosome representing the three RNA molecules and more than 50 proteins it is composed of. Remarkably, despite the large size and extreme complexity of this magnificent machine, bacterial cells can assemble thousands of fully functional ribosomes within mere minutes and ter terrific precision. The ability of the cell to rapidly manufacture such a complex macromolecule with such efficiency makes this a fascinating model system for understanding the assembly of biological macromolecules. Furthermore, although ri the ribosome serves as a platform for targeting antimicrobials, the biogenesis pathway itself remains to be utilized and could provide a new source for novel therapeutics. The prokaryotic 70S ribosome is composed of two subunits, termed 30S and the 50S subunit. These two subunits are manufactured independently within the cell and ultimately associate to form functional 70S ribosomes. The function of the 30S subunit is to facilitate decoding of the mRNA message by codon anticoding base pairing during translation, and the role of the 50S subunit is to catalyze the formation of protein bonds. Today I'll be focusing primarily on the 30S subunit. 30S ribosome biogenesis is a complex process involving the assembly of 21 proteins and an RNA molecule in a series of overlapping steps. Initially, the RNA is transcribed from an operon and processed while S proteins are simultaneously being translated. The RNA then begins to fold into its secondary and tertiary structure and S proteins bind to the RNA scaffold to help stabilize the structure. Lastly, there is a series of RNA and protein modifications that can occur. Once the RNA has adopted its final tertiary structure and all the proteins have bound, the 30S subunit is able to associate with the 50S subunit during translation initiation. Essentially, the, the process of ribosome subunit biogenesis is an intricate dance of RNA folding and simultaneously S protein binding. RNA processing occurs by multiple endo and exonucleases is an essential step to the formation of functional 30S subunits. Specifically, 17S RNA is initially transcribed in an operon along with 50S ribosomal RNA, termed 23S and 5S, and one or two tRNA molecules. Immediately upon transcription, RNase 3 processes the 17S RNA transcript by removing it from the operon in the form of an immature RNA molecule. Subsequently, the 17S RNA molecule is further processed by removal of additional nucleotides on the 5' prime and 3' prime ends to form a mature 16S RNA molecule. While RNA processing is occurring, S proteins are simultaneously binding to the RNA molecule scaffold. Interestingly, seminal experiments in the 1960s by Nomura demonstrated that active 30S subunits could be assembled in vitro simply by adding free RNA and ribosomal proteins together without any additional components. These in vitro reconstitution experiments demonstrated that remarkably, all of the information necessary for assembly is encoded within the RNA and proteins themselves. It was further demonstrated by varying the order in which the proteins were added 
that protein binding events are thermodynamically interdependent and that the ribosome proteins bind in a hierarchical manner. Specifically, primary proteins, S proteins, were identified to bind directly to the RNA. Secondary proteins are required, require the presence of primary proteins, and tertiary proteins require the presence of secondary proteins. Impressively, these landmark findings of the Nomura assembly map have remained largely unchanged since it was established over 45 years ago. During this process of RNA folding and protein binding, multiple assembly factors help ensure efficiency by preventing folding intermediates from becoming trapped into local energy minima and productively altering the RNA folding landscape. There have now been over 60 prokaryotic ribosome assembly factors identified in bacteria, including GTPases, RNA chaperones and helicase, and protein and RNA modifying enzymes. Although in recent years many ribosome assembly factors have been identified, there is still little understanding to exactly what they do and how they aid in maturation. Furthermore, understanding the specific functions of these factors may help to identify steps of the ribosome biogenesis pathway that will provide targets for new antimicrobials. Four assembly factors that have previously been considered for possible drug targets are YJQ, ERA, RIMM, and RBFA. YJQ and ERA are both GTPases, and RBFA and RIMM have been loosely classified as maturation factors. These four factors have been shown to be functionally linked using a combination of genetic, biochemical, and structural approaches. For instance, overexpression of one factor can compensate for deletion of another factor, and a direct functional relationship has been shown between YJQ and RBFA. Despite the growing information on these protein assembly factors, a detailed understanding of their interactions with assembling ribosomal particles remains elusive. A substantial obstacle when studying ribosome assembly is that the process is so rapidly efficient in cells that intermediates do not naturally accumulate. Consequently, it is hard to obtain ribosomal particles that are in the process of being assembled by protein factors and then thus identify the specific roles that they play. The left figure shows the absorbance profile of ribosomes purified by sucrose gradient ultracentrifugation, causing the separation of individual 30, 50S, and 70S ribosomes. Based on the absorbance profile, the majority of ribosome constituents are in the associated 70S form with little free subunits remaining. As you can see, it would be difficult to harvest appreciable quantities of in vivo assembled subunits in wild type cells. To try and circumvent this problem, recent studies from multiple labs have focused on knocking out identified assembly factors with the hopes of stalling maturation and increasing the amount of immature subunits found in the cell. Analysis of ribosome profiles in E. coli strains with the assembly factor RIM-M knocked out revealed that there is indeed an increase in the free 30S and 50S subunits and a decrease in the 70S ribosomes. This was great news because it gave us a tool to investigate the, sub, the assembly process in vivo by providing a source of immature subunits that could then be harvested for further investigation. So the main objective of this research project was to gain insights into the role of assembly factors by advancing our understanding on the nature of the particles that accumulate upon their deletion in bacterial strains. And the two specific aims we wanted to address for this research project were to determine whether accumulated particles are competent for maturation and then to characterize the binding interactions of assembly factors with mature and immature 30S particles. A characteristic of mature 30S and 50S subunit, ribosomal subunits is that they can associate to form 70S ribosomes. Thus, an initial question we had was whether the immature particles that accumulate in the assembly factor knockout strains are capable of maturation and subsequent association into 70S ribosomes. Alternatively, the accumulated immature particles may not be competent for maturation into a functional 30S subunit and simply represent a dead end product that would ultimately be degraded for degradation. To address this concern, both an in vitro and an in vivo approach was taken to determine the possible fates of immature subunits isolated from the delta YJQ and delta RIMM bacterial strains. Now, an in vitro maturation assay was developed to determine if immature 30S subunits then accumulate in these strains were competent for maturation by assessing their ability to associate with free 50S subunits and form 70S ribosomes. 
previous structural analysis of the immature subunits that accumulate upon deletion of assembly factors has shown that they do not contain structure in their inter-subunit bridges and are therefore unable to associate with 50S subunits. So they need to further mature to be able to form a functional 70S ribosome. So for these experiments, briefly, the various E. coli strains were grown in liquid media, lysed with the French press, cleared of cellular debris, and then lysates were subsequently concentrated. Concentrated cell lysates were then incubated at either 4 degrees Celsius or 37 degrees Celsius for various times, and then crude ribosome preparations were prepared by a series of salt washes and ultracentrifugations. Crude ribosome extracts were layered onto a sucrose gradient, and ribosome components were separated through an overnight ultracentrifugation. Samples were then run through an FPLC, and absorbance 255 readings were used to monitor and quantify the peaks correlating to the 30S, 50S, and 70S ribosomes. If 30S subunits were indeed competent for maturation and subsequent association with the 50S subunits to form 70S ribosomes, then there would be an expected decrease in the amount of free subunits and increase in the 70S ribosomes during incubation of the concentrated cell lysates. Our initial control experiments were performed in wild-type cells to confirm that there is a small pool of free subunits in concentrated cell lysates and to determine if there was any further maturation of these subunits upon incubation at 37 or 4 degrees Celsius. In the top panel on the left-hand side is the ribosome absorbance profiles from concentrated wild-type cell lysate incubated at 4 degrees Celsius, and on the right is the quantification of the free 30S, free 50S, and total 70S ribosomes. Based on the distribution of particles, you can see that the majority of subunits have associated to form 70S ribosomes with very few free subunits remaining. In the bottom panel is the ribosome profile and quantification from concentrated cell lysates incubated at 37 degrees Celsius. Incubation of wild-type cell lysates at 37 did not change the overall appearance of ribosome particles, indicating that there was no further association of subunits to form 70S ribosomes in our control wild-type experiment. Next, we performed the in vitro maturation assay to determine if the accumulated immature particles in the assembly factor knockout strains were competent for maturation. The top panel shows the in vitro maturation results for the YJQ knockout strain and the bottom panel for the RIMM knockout strain. In both cases, incubation at 37 degrees versus 4 degrees Celsius showed a marked decrease in free 30S subunits, free 50S subunits, and a corresponding increase in 70S ribosomes. These results indicated that the immature 30S particles that accumulate in either the delta YJQ or delta RIMM strain are capable of associating with 50S subunits to form 70S ribosomes. After utilizing an in vitro approach to determine the ability of immature 30S particles to mature and associate with 50S subunits, we next wanted to assess maturation in vivo by tracking 16S RNA maturation. To do this, we first wanted to assess the distribution of RNA in the various strains to determine if monitoring progression of 17S to 16S RNA would be a suitable parameter for maturation. For this, we isolated total cellular RNA as well as RNA from the 30S, 50S, and 70S peaks. We then ran the RNA on an agros gel and assessed the distribution of mature 16S and 17S RNA, immature 17S RNA. The 70S ribosomes in the knockout strains contain almost exclusively mature 16S RNA. Therefore, we can use the amount of 17S RNA, or the ratio of 17 to 16S RNA, as a proxy to assess maturation of 30S subunits. To assess maturation of 17S RNA into 16S RNA, we performed a pulse chase experiment. For these experiments, E. coli cells were grown to mid-log phase and then pulsed with tritium-labeled uracil, followed by a chase with an excess amount of uracil to allow for labeling and subsequent tracking of the RNA. The cells were then harvested at various times points post-chase, and total RNA was purified and separated based on size by gel electrophoresis. This was then imaged. Therefore, this pulse-chase approach allowed us to track the fate of the RNA species in the cell. 
The rationale behind this approach is that if the 17S RNA is being processed by removal of its 5' prime and 3' prime ends, then over time there will be a transition from the signal from the higher molecular weight 17S RNA species to the lower molecular weight 16S RNA species. Conversely, if the labeled 17S RNA was incapable of being processed into 16S RNA, then it would subsequently be degraded over time. Shown here is a pulse chase experiment with the wild type cells as a control in the top panel. Immediately after the pulse chase, the entire radioactive label can be seen in the form of the higher molecular weight 17S RNA band. Over the time course of 25 minutes, in the wild type strain, you can see the radioactive signal transition from into the lower molecular weight mature 16S RNA. Conversely, when the pulse chase experiments were performed on cells from the delta rim M strain, there is a notably different phenotype. Shortly after the pulse chase, the majority of the radioactive label is in the form of 17S RNA. Over the time course of the experiment, there is a transition of 17S RNA into 16S RNA, indicating that the immature particles are able to mature. However, this process is stunted and takes a lot longer in the delta rim M strain. When the delta rim M strain is transformed with an overexpression plasmid for rim M, it rescues the delayed processing phenotype, and there is again a rapid transition of 17S RNA into 16S RNA. This data suggests that in the assembly factor knockout strains, a large portion of immature 17S RNA is processed into 16S RNA. This in vivo approach validates the in vitro maturation assays and indicates that the immature particles in knockout strains are indeed competent for maturation. After confirming that the immature 30S particles were competent for maturation, we next wanted to assess the binding interactions of these particles with assembly factors. It has previously been hypothesized that the non-native particles that accumulate upon the deletion of assembly factors represent bona fide intermediates that are the actual substrates for the deleted assembly factor and therefore we wanted to use these particles as a tool for better understanding the assembly pathway. To test the binding interactions, we initially used a combination of filtration and pelleting assays. For these assays, we incubated purified assembly factors and ribosomes and then centrifuged the solution through a 100 kilodalton cutoff filter. Because all of the proteins are much smaller than 100 kilodaltons, they will pass through the filter. However, any proteins that bind to the ribosome will be retained by the filter. Similarly, for the pelleting assays, the, purity, the purified factors are incubated together and then ultrasensed through, through a sucrose gradient. Any factors that bind to the ribosome will pellet with it, and the ones that do not bind will remain in the supernatant. After performing the experiments, all samples are run through SDS page analysis. Shown here are the binding assays for YJQ, interacting with mature 30S subunits and immature ribosomal 30S particles. On the left-hand side is the filtration assay results, and on the right-hand side are the pelleting assay results. For the pelleting assays, when YJQ is incubated alone, it remains entirely in the supernatant. Conversely, when YJQ is incubated with mature 30S subunits, it binds to the subunit and remains in the pellet portion. Similarly, when, IJ, when YJQ was incubated with immature ribosomal subunits isolated from the two knockout strains, delta YJQ and delta rim M, there also appeared to be binding as indicated by the presence of YJQ in the pellet portion. The pelleting assay on the right-hand side, or the filtration assay on the right-hand side, sorry, showed a similar result of YJQ being able to bind to all three subunits from their respective strains. Based on this data, it appeared that YJQ may interact more strongly with mature 30S subunits compared to the immature particles. However, it was very hard to discern any difference. We next performed the pelleting and filtration assays to assess the binding of ERA with mature 30S subunits and immature 30S particles. On the left-hand side are the results of the pelleting assay, showing that ERA is indeed capable of binding to all three particles, both the mature 30S subunit and the immature particles. Similarly, the results from the filtration assays on the right-hand side show that ERA is capable of interacting with the mature and immature particles. Despite being able to use these assays to confirm that binding was happening, we could not determine any differences in the various binding affinities.
when we perform the filtration assays to assess binding of either RIMM or RBFA to the mature 30S subunits or immature particles, we essentially did not detect any binding at all by the presence of almost no band in the band fractions. After performing numerous binding assays that utilized significant sample and time consumption, we decided we needed a method in place that could help us better quantify these various ribosome protein interactions. It was important that our method of choice use minimal sample consumption because we were very limited in our yields from the ribosome purifications. For this, we turned to a technique known as microscale thermophoresis. To accomplish this, we use MST, which is a technique that monitors the directed movement of molecules in a temperature gradient. Essentially, when a molecule is exposed to a temperature gradient, it has a tendency to typically migrate away from the heated area based on its serrate coefficient, which is dependent on size, charge, and hydration shell. Importantly, any binding event will alter the serrate coefficient and thus affect the thermophytic mobility of the particle. Therefore, by tracking molecules using fluorescence and then exposing them to a temperature gradient, you can measure binding through the changes in thermophytic mobility. In a typical MST experiment, a serial dilution of the ligand from high to low concentration is pipetted into up to 16 microtubes. The target is fluorescently labeled and added at a constant concentration to the serially, serially diluted ligand. The samples are then loaded into the monolith, are then loaded into capillaries to capillary force action and loaded into the MST instrument known as the monolith. The monolith then performs the MST analysis by scanning one capillary at a time and plotting the changes in fluorescence over time. Shown here is an example of what an MST trace will look like for a single sample. The fluorescence is initially normalized and then an infrared laser turns on to create a microscopic temperature gradient. As a result, the particles move away from the temperature gradient causing a decrease in fluorescence and eventually reach steady state. The IR laser is then turned off and the molecules will back diffuse. This analysis is then performed across the entire serial dilution, which will include all the way from saturating to no binding conditions. The F norm values are then plotted in a semi-log fashion over ligand concentration and fit to the law of mass action to calculate a KD. To perform these MST experiments, we first fluorescently labeled our target, the 30S subunit, on cysteine residues using a red fluorescence dye. Next, we performed the serial dilution of our ligand, in this case, purified assembly factors from high to low concentration. The labeled ribosomes were then added at a constant concentration to the serially diluted assembly factors, loaded into capillaries, and then placed into the monolith for MST analysis. Shown here are the MST results of YJQ binding to mature 30S subunits. Consistent with previous literature, in the presence of the non-hydrolyzable GTPN analog, GMPMP, YJQ was shown to have a high affinity in the low nanomolar range towards mature 30S subunits. When we removed GMPMP and used GDP instead, shown in the bottle panel, there was no binding, which was consistent with what we expected from previous data and literature. This was a great result because not only did it confirm numerous previous experiments, but it quickly demonstrated the potential that MST had with clarifying our ribosome protein interaction. We next utilized MST to assess the interactions of YJQ with the immature ribosome particles isolated from the delta YJQ and delta RIMM strains. And the top panel shows the MST for YJQ binding to immature 30S particles isolated from delta YJQ, and the bottom is delta RIMM. The, the raw MST traces are on the left, and the plotted data on the right. Surprisingly, there was a substantially lowered affinity of YJQ to either immature particle compared to the mature 30S subunits. And in this case, the protein cannot reach saturating conditions to calculate a KD. When performing the MST analysis to assess the binding of ERA to either mature 30S subunits or immature 30S particles from the knockout strains, we saw a similar trend as we did with YJQ. As you can see from the binding curves, ERA had a higher affinity to the mature 30S subunit compared to either of the immature particles. The KD of ERA binding to the mature 30S subunit was in the low micromolar range. However, in the case of ERA binding to immature 30S subunits, the complex would not saturate even at the highest concentrations used. 
in the case of RIMM and RBFA binding to the mature 30S subunits and immature particles, they exhibited low affinity to essentially all the different particles tested. There was an exception of RIMM binding to the mature 30S particle with a KD at about 116 micromolar. Now that we had a much better quantitative understanding of the binding interactions of these four assembly factors with both mature 30S subunits and immature 30S particles, we wanted to assess the occupancy of these factors on ribosome particles in vivo. To do this, we purified the 30S particles from the wild type and assembly factor knockout strains using a slow salt wash protocol. This low salt wash protocol was utilized to help preserve any native assembly factor ribosome interactions occurring within the cell. After purifying the ribosome particles under low salt conditions, we then performed a quantitative mass spectrometry analysis to determine the occupancy of all the S proteins and assembly factors bound to the ribosome particles from the various strains. The top panel shows the abundance of each S protein in ribosomes harvested from the wild type and knockout strains relative to that of a mature 30S subunit. Interestingly, in immature 30S particles isolated from the two knockout strains, there is mostly a full protein complement with the exception of several tertiary binding proteins such as S2, S3, and S21 that have been depleted. This indicates that these immature 30S particles are near the very late stages of the assembly process. Shown in the bottom panel is the relative abundance of assembly factors YJQ, RIMM, and RBFA on the ribosomal particles isolated from the various strains. As you can see, there is a very low occupancy of any of these factors on the ribosome particles isolated under low salt conditions, which was in agreement with some of our previous binding data. This suggests that the immature 30S particles that accumulate upon assembly factor deletion are not bona fide intermediates that represent the actual substrates or deleted factors. This was quite an unexpected result for us. Our current thinking is that in the absence of assembly factors, the on-pathway intermediates that represent the actual substrate of the assembly factors transition into a thermodynamically stable intermediate that does not exhibit high affinity to the factors. This would imply that the actual substrates are upstream of the accumulated intermediates in the null strains. Consistent with this, recent work has shown that RIMM and ERA increase the rates of association of several earlier binding proteins therefore allowing us to estimate when these proteins function in the assembly pathway. By using the QMS analysis of the immature 30S particles and information about the hierarchy of binding from the Nomura assembly map, we can place the particles that accumulate in the null strains at the very late stages of assembly and more importantly, downstream of the particles recognized by assembly factors. So some concluding remarks now are that microscale thermophoresis helped us better understand the binding interactions of ribosomal particles with protein factors. Immature ribosomal particles that accumulate upon deletion of assembly factors are competent for maturation. However, they represent off-pathway intermediates. True assembly factor substrates precede the accumulated particles in the knockout strains, and ultimately this study helped us better understand the nature of Im immature ribosomal particles that accumulate upon deletion of assembly factors. With that, I would like to acknowledge my PhD supervisor, Dr. Joaquin Ortega, the department chair of the McMaster Biochemistry Department, Dr. Brian Coombs, my committee members, Dr. Nathan McGarvey and Dr. Russell Bishop, and all members of the Ortega Lab and previous collaborators. Thank you for your time, and with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Thurlow. We have several questions. Our first one, what would be the purpose of assembly factors binding to mature ribosomes? The, the likely explanation for that is that the assembly factors have multiple roles throughout assembly and are involved in both actually assembling the ribosomal particles as well as perhaps aiding as a checkpoint protein at the end of assembly. So an example would be in the eukaryotic system, which is much better understood than the prokaryotic system, there's actually a licensing step that occurs during assembly where the assembly factors will bind to the 40S subunit, remain bound, and then will actually have a translation-like cycle with the 70 or with the 50S, 60S subunit 
without any mRNA or initiation factors present. So in this case, the assembly factors are actually probing specific functional areas of the ribosome to ensure that they are functional before going into the active translating pool of ribosomes. And a recent publication in the prokaryotic field actually showed that the, uh, a very high resolution structure of YJQ bound to the 30S subunit showed that it seems to actually be assessing the ability of the 30S subunit to do uh, proper fidelity checkpoints during translation. So a role for binding to mature 30S subunits would be that they function as checkpoint proteins to make sure that everything is working properly. All right. I hear ribosomes are hard to make. Do you have to label your protein? And how much sample do you use for MST? Ribosomes, they're very, they are very challenging to purify in at least large quantities. So any sort of bioanalytical assays that you want to do with them need to be conscious of the fact that it's hard to get large proportions. And yes, in my case, I did fluorescently label the ribosome to perform these assays. But fortunately, the experiment uses very low sample consumption of the labeled particles. So in this case, I was only using 50 nanomolar concentrations of ribosome, which was very low and used very little sample. Alternatively, when performing an MST experiment, there is also an option for label-free system, in which case, rather than adding a, fluorescent, a fluorophore to the, to the protein, you can actually monitor the changes in fluorescence simply by looking at tryptophan fluorescence. So you don't necessarily need to perform the labeling. All right. Are there any antibiotics that target ribosome assembly, and can MSD be used to find new antibiotics in this class? So that's a, a very interesting emerging field, um, emerging topic in the field right now. There are many antibiotics that target the fully formed 30S and 50S subunits. However, there remains to be any antibiotics that actually inhibit ribosome assembly. Recently, a finding from McMaster University identified through a small molecule screen that the molecule lamotrigine, which is actually an anticonvulsant, is able to specifically inhibit ribosome assembly. And this is one of the first small molecules that has been shown to specifically inhibit ribosome assembly. And absolutely, MST would be a fantastic technique for assessing the interactions of any identified targets, such as small molecules or other protein factors, with various ribosomal particles. Our next question, can you analyze RNA processing using MST? That would be a tricky one to do because one of the biggest questions that remain right now is that they're un it's, it hasn't quite been identified yet, the specific RNases that are involved within RNA processing. However, you would certainly be able to use purified RNA, label it at either the 5' prime or 3' prime end, and then add in RNases. And then as the RNases cleave the labeled RNA, that will cause a shift in the thermophytic mobility. So you would be able to use MST to assess that change in RNA cleavage over time. And there actually has been a few papers out there that have used MST to look at DNA nucleases in the processes of uh, DNA. Given that the assembly factors bind at different affinities to the immature particles, is it possible that it binds through a mediator like another protein or small molecule? In the case of, of YJQ and ERA, there actually is another molecule that is necessary for the binding. So because they are GTPases, in this case, they actually require GTP or a GTP analog to be present to facilitate the binding. And then the current hypothesis is that once these molecules bind, the ribosome actually stimulates GTP hydrolysis, causing the conversion of GTP to GDP, which has a much lower affinity to the ribosome, and therefore the assembly factor will fall off at the end. So they do actually require the mediation of other molecules for binding. And some of these factors, they, um, they, they do have different binding sites because there's actually several structures out there for YJQ, ERA, and RBFA that show where these factors bind around the functional core of the 30S subunit, and they are non-overlapping binding sites. All right, perfect. That appears to be our last question. So I'd like to thank you so much, Dr. Brett Thurlow, for your presentation today. I'd like to thank Nanotemper Technologies for sponsoring today's web symposium. Most of all, I'd like to thank those of you who came and spent some time with us. We hope you found the time useful and information that can make your research a bit easier. So with that, 
On behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia Series, I'd like to wish you all a good day. <laughs>